Hello, and welcome to show number 2301 of Eyes on Success, a weekly program covering a wide variety of topics of interest to people with vision loss. I'm Nancy Goodman Torpy. And I'm Pete Torpy. I don't think I've ever said this before, but the three of us really clicked. We liked each other, we respected each other, and where we did have differences of opinion, they were heated discussions, but we were all basically on the same page. And that really, I'm sure, is why we were able to work so well together. Yeah, I think you're right, Glenn. And today, we'll be talking with three long-term colleagues and good friends who have made major contributions to the field of accessibility. We'll be speaking with Ted Henter, founder of Henter Joyce, Eric Damery, recently retired vice president of blindness products, and Glenn Gordon, lead software developer now at Freedom Scientific, about the early days and progression of the JAWS screen reader that they are responsible for. But first for our tip of the week. This week's tip comes from Glenn Gordon. My tip of the week is try to find a way to do the thing that you're really passionate about. And if you do the thing that you're passionate about and that gets you excited every morning, you may have more of an impact on others than you might expect. Support for Eyes on Success is provided by APHConnectCenter.org, empowering people toward independence and success by providing blogs, information, and resources for individuals of all ages who are blind or visually impaired. Information and referral line are at 1-800-232-5463. You are listening to Eyes on Success. Success, 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 success. Let's start by meeting Eric, Glenn, and Ted in alphabetical order. So, Eric, can you start by introducing yourself? Hi, Nancy and Pete. This is Eric Damery, and uh, I'm from Florida and had spent about 28 years or, or thereabouts connected with Henry Joyce, Freedom Scientific, and most recently Vespero, retiring from the company in the end of July 2022. And I worked in sales and product management throughout my career, um, primarily on the JAWS line. And Glenn? Hi, I'm Glenn Gordon. Uh, Working for Freedom Scientific now, thanks to the good auspices of Ted Hunter back in 1994. I've been with the company for a few months shorter than Eric was prior to his retirement. But I continue on here, and it's great to continue to be working on JAWS. And Ted? I'm Ted Hunter. Uh, I've started the company, Hunter Joyce, with Bill Joyce, another blind person. He provided the money, and I ran the company. And as luck would have it, Eric just walked in the door one day and wanted a job. And he's fabulous. And then a little bit later, well, Glenn and I knew each other from when I was working for Dean Blasey. And Glenn had some of our products, and so we got together. And eventually, Glenn is a superstar programmer, so he came on board. And he handled the technical issues with JAWS, and Eric did the sales issues. And those two guys are the reason JAWS is where it is today. Now, most of our listeners know that JAWS and everything else that Freedom Scientific has produced is adaptive technology for people with vision loss. Um, I gather only two of the three of you actually need those products. Yeah, that's right. Uh I'm uh, fully sighted and, again, I've found the business because my father was visually impaired, and that's how I got to meet Ted and his wife and, and learn about the company and the products and, and got involved. But uh, I know how to use them, but uh, I haven't, haven't had the need to. Yeah, Eric, Eric's the best sighted person I've ever seen use a product like JAWS. And I'm glad he mentioned my wife because Mel and I uh, ran the company with Bill Joyce's money. And then Bill had other issues and wanted to move on, so we bought him out in the 
early 90s, I guess, and just before Eric and Glenn joined the effort. And Glenn? I'm actually the only one of us who was born blind, so I've been blind all of my life and needed software like JAWS from the date I knew it existed. I needed it before then, but, you know, didn't know. (laughs) Support for Eyes on Success is made possible in part by our corporate partners. Find out more about partnership opportunities by sending an email to hosts at eyesonsuccess.net. This week's focus topic is how the JAWS screen reader got started and what Eric, Glenn, and Ted did to make it successful. Well, as you mentioned in the introduction, Ted, you were blind and started this whole ball rolling and ran into Eric and Glenn and quickly hired them. But your need for screen readers came out of a motorcycle accident. You were initially sighted. And then you had to develop some of these things as tools for yourself. Did you do some of the coding of the early JAWS for DOS? Yes, Pete. Uh, I was a professional motorcycle racer in the 70s. And I was in England for some racing. And uh, I forgot you're supposed to drive on the left side of the road. So I had an accident, my fault. And I lost my eyesight in the crash. Thankfully, the other folks were okay. They had their seatbelts on. I didn't. So once I recovered from the injuries, et cetera, a division of blind services, DBS helps people that are blind here in Florida. He said, hey, computers are a good field to go into. So I thought, okay, I'll go back to college. And I learned a little bit about computing. I met another person that hired me. Then I met Dean Blazy, and he hired me. And things went on from there. So, yes, my main motivation was I needed I wanted to have a screen reader for myself and Bill Joyce is the guy that said hey let's let's start a company so we did and then as luck would have it Eric walked in and then Glenn called on the phone and things went on from there so it's amazing how things just came together I, I just happened to be in the right place at the right time Ted did you write the original code for JAWS I did do a little bit of programming early on, but I'm not a very good programmer. And it's a good thing Glenn came along because that's what made JAWS for Windows work. But what Ted did have, um, and it was, you know, it came out in the DOS product with the macro language, is the insight, the intuition to recognize what it was he needed the screen reader to provide, and the product had the tools in it that he could do the customizations and and really make the product sing. That's the one, you know, I used to say to people. I mean, we really, that was the difference between JAWS and other products is that we could really get JAWS to behave at the moment you needed it in a way that, that was very helpful and productive. You know, we had a scripting language and not that many people did scripting but it left open the possibility that someone could go and script an app for a person at a workplace. And without such a language to allow such configurations, it wouldn't have been as flexible. Well, you know, when I was working at Xerox and they changed from using DOS to Windows, people were wondering, how is Pete going to use Windows on a PC? And so I started trying out various screen readers because there were a number at the time that were competing for that market. And I tried several, and I was just about to give up because none of them really worked. And then I finally tried JAWS, and I thought, wow, this just works. And I realized later on that the reason it worked was it was developed by blind people. I mean, primarily Glenn getting the Windows versions going and Ted getting the DOS versions going, and it had to work. And I think that's what made the difference with having JAWS be so usable. I think you're right, Pete. So now you guys hired within a few years of each other then? Months, I think. Yeah, I think so. And that was the first, when you came on board, Glenn, that was the first thrust towards making JAWS work with Windows, which was new at the time. It had actually begun about a year or a year and a half earlier with a guy named Chuck Opperman, who had started uh, working as the lone programmer for Heather Joyce at the time. 
And he provided a valuable thing, something that I couldn't create because I knew nothing about programming for Windows because I couldn't access it. You know, and I wasn't even that competent a programmer. I just happened to have a real drive. And so what Chuck had done was he created the framework of the program. There were lots of bugs, but he created a framework. And I could never have done that at the time I came to work at the company. And even though at the time he left, the software you know, still wasn't quite ready for release, he had done so much of that early work that I was able to then go in and, you know, fix a bunch of things and build on it. But it was that early foundation that really helped. And I guess in some sense, you had to bootstrap the whole system because you were using these tools as you were developing them, but you were using the tools as part of your work process. I did most of my development in DOS, and I had a secret weapon. It was the one-hour demo of Slimware Window Bridge. And when I needed to read documentation about how to do things in Windows, I would launch Window Bridge, go into Windows, read the documentation, close Windows, go back to JAWS for DOS, make changes, try running JAWS, rinse, repeat. And I knew we had done reasonably well when I was able to remove my Window Bridge demo. So how long did it take you to get JAWS into a state that it was operational in Windows after you started making this transformation? Please offer a definition of operational. <laughs> <laughs> it sort of worked in version 1.0, but it didn't necessarily work for all that long without having to restart it. I have a very clear recollection of this <laughs> um, because when I started to work with Ted, that was January of 94. I was told about the product. I wasn't shown any product. And uh, I think it was that July of 94, probably a month or so, Ted, uh, before uh, Glenn came on board, that we went to the conventions. And at that time, I recall I could basically show Notepad and reading the desktop, and not for very long. <laughs> and it was the 1.21 version the following June, June 1995, when it actually got real stable and you could, you could consistently sit down and work on your computer for a while. I remember that. And how much after that was it that you got involved in the head-to-head -head competitions of the various screen readers to see who could actually make their screen readers work. Yeah, that was dueling windows. And that got started during Closing the Gap and CSUN, probably in 95 or 96 is the time frame that that was happening. Yeah. Mark Nelson started it with Greg Mize. We actually released JAWS for Windows in January of 95. That wasn't perfect, but it was usable. And then we did well in building Windows, but um, what's that guy's name, Josh? Josh Mealy. Mealy. Yeah, he kicked our butts in the first dueling Windows. He was very smart, and he was using um, Outspoken. And the, the key test was, can you uh, use the Windows file open dialog and open a file? Well, Glenn fixed that. Ours, I think Josh was the only one that did it that way, but he, Josh, did it a different way, <laughs> and he opened the file very simply, and he, he was a very sharp young man. The dueling windows was terrific, and we owe Mark Nelson a lot for that, because it did demonstrate differences of the various products. It was interesting, because if we were to watch a replay of dueling windows, I think we'd all be horrified at the simplicity of the tasks that they were having us do. But at that point, opening a document in Word, entering some text and doing a spell check was a monumental accomplishment in Windows. And even though it didn't seem like much, it was the foundation that everything else got built on. You're right, Glenn. Josh Mealy is recently a MacArthur Fellow, by the way. And we've had him on the show several times and talked to him since then. Yes, he's, he does a lot of good work. 
So in these dueling window competitions, you knew what the task was ahead of time, so you could presumably fine-tune your systems to make sure you could perform these tasks, I take it. I don't know about that, Pete. Ahead of time meaning maybe half an hour. The first one or or two, we didn't. The I think towards the end of Dueling Windows, I think we did it probably three times. And certainly on the third one, we had kind of agreed upon what the tasks would be before we ever uh, got to the convention. So we did have time to make sure that we could, you know, make our product shine the best we could. And who did these competitions? I know, Eric, being cited, you're one of the people who I think is cited and most expert at using a screen reader who can see. But did they have you doing this or people like Ted and Glenn who can't see doing these competitions? <laughs> I did one or two. And, you know, you're sitting there on the stage, and but the monitor is facing the audience. So you, you cannot see, even if you could see, you're, you're not seeing the screen. And I was practicing to make sure I could do what was requested. And, of course, everybody in the audience could see that I was practicing, and that was not kosher oh how funny (laughs) i got kicked out of there i think glenn took over after that i took over and did netscape i said ted has been banished to his room i'm here to demonstrate (laughs) netscape yeah i was a bad boy i forgot that you were practicing i thought you were uh just being a a smart aleck to him I got to say, you know, it it sounds like, you know, everybody was just showing how their product worked. This was really high pressure, and we certainly all felt it. I mean, at the time, Henner Joyce was a fairly small company, you know, maybe 15, 20 people, 20, 30 people at the most at that time. And um, the other companies were all even smaller than we were. And there were about seven or eight competitors up there. And this industry is a small industry. There's not that many products sold. So uh, all the companies were not going to survive. And these events were critical to agencies, state and federal, and international decisions getting made based on the outcome of this. And I remember it was at Closing the Gap that uh, following the convention, uh, Glenn and I sat down with the people from Anse in Spain and uh, kind of inked the agreement with them. And it was based on, you know, the things that they were seeing. Many of those competitors were not around for very long, were they? No. But Eric, Eric I think you're wrong about the number of people we had. We probably had 10 or 12 people when Jaws for Windows first came out. Yeah, that's probably right. Tell them about the, our German friends, how that happened. Yeah, so Ted's company and the DOS product primarily was sold in the English-speaking markets, really in the U.S. and some in the U.K. through Sight and Sound. And we were approached by two guys, Tobias Winnis and Kai Deka Conradi, and they were connected with Dr. Guldner Group, which was a fairly large insurance company. And these guys had come up with the plan that, you know, if if they approached us from a big company, they could get us to to give them the rights to sell our software into those foreign-speaking markets. And uh, it made sense to us. We needed the help. We didn't have the people. We weren't going to get there without somebody. Uh, They came over to the company, met with us. We gave them some demo software, and they went back and started working on localization. And Tobias is uh, he's the global sales manager for Vispero today. So it was a very good relationship that we started with them. So that was a big opportunity and gave you guys a big jump forward, I guess. That was huge. Yeah, very huge. Jaws eventually became the predominant screen reader that people were using around the world, and the company started growing and growing. And eventually, you were bought out by Freedom Scientific. How did that change the company around, I guess, around 2000 that happened? Yeah, it was 2001, I believe. I got concerned about Microsoft doing their own screen reader and putting us out of business. So I did some marketing and made it known that the company was for sale. And Richard Chandler was interested. He had done Sunrise Medical, which was all the stuff you need after you leave the hospital. 
you know, hospital beds, uh, oxygen tanks, wheelchairs. He made a ton of money in that industry. And I told him about um, Arkenstone and Blazy Engineering and Henry Joyce, of course. We all were friends and we had products for blind people, but we weren't competitors because we had different products. So he came to one of the big shows, I think maybe the NFB, got to meet everybody and he put the deal together and he, and he bought our companies. Well, unfortunately, in the beginning, he, he was very convincing that he was going to do a good job and he was a nice guy and he liked what we were doing. Once he got control of the company, he turned into a, being a real jerk and was pissing off a lot of our customers, our distributors, our dealers, and me and Dean. Uh, Jim Fruchterman had, had no plans to work for him, but I did plan to work for Richard, and so did Dean. But he's, he screwed up so much. We talked to the venture capitalists, and they, they said, okay, we got to go talk to Richard. And I well, of course you do. Well, Richard being a sharp guy, he convinced the VCs that we were the jerks and not him. So <laughs> the, the VCs asked us to leave, which we did voluntarily. Uh, Dean and I, uh, shall we say, donated our sales contract money to the employees as bonuses when we left. That's what happened. So we left, not voluntarily, but at the request of the venture capitalists. And I was disappointed, but that's the way it works. Well, it's interesting, you know, when venture capitalists take over businesses, especially businesses like you had started, you had very different goals in mind when you started. This was functionally something you could use, people like you could use. And I would guess you had very different interests, whereas when venture capital people take over companies, they're usually interested in the financial returns, right? You're exactly right, Pete. At that point, it all just turned into making money instead of making a good product. So did this substantially change the complexion of the company and how it worked and how it focused? Or did things eventually sort of level out and worked out okay? I would say they definitely leveled out and worked out okay. I mean, we've been through multiple CEOs, and the complexion of the company has changed. And, you know, as with, with any relationship, you work things out over time. And fortunately, you know, being user-facing first, and those, those concepts really have, have carried forth, uh, despite some of the, uh, the bumps like the ones that Ted was describing. Well, I guess at some point you do have to satisfy your customers, right? Or you don't sell products. Yes. But what the venture capitalists were looking for was growth, financial return. And they didn't keep uh, Richard Chandler around too long. They moved him out some point in the end of 2002, I think. And uh, they hired Lee Hamilton, who came in and ran the company for well over a decade and Lee got us into the hardware low vision business which really you know took us out of being primarily a software and a braille note taker company and and turned us into a much bigger company and Freedom Scientific became the the global leader in everything right so the infusion of capital can sometimes have some positive impacts in terms of growth and hiring more resources to do bigger and better jobs Right. And and Lee was really uh, an engineer and I think kind of embraced creating some more products in that low vision space and competing with the, the Optilex and Enhanced Visions of the world. So, Well, it sounds like a fun ride for all of you guys and it sounds like you've all, you've all had a good time and remained good friends. And the customers, you know, were... You know, in the beginning, we maybe did ten thousand DOS screen readers over the over the course of of the six or seven or eight years there that they were selling DOS screen readers, which wasn't that many. And we knew so many of those customers. Uh, Ted was answering phone calls for tech support when people would call in, and uh, you know, just had a good relationship and knew a lot of people. 
that has just expanded and exploded. And, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of customers out there today, and we don't know them all, but we've found ways of reaching out. And um, we've had great relationships with beta testers. It was a good run, and we were all in it for the... For, we were all in it for the same reasons, to make sure that we produced a great product that, that was going to be successful and help people get employed and get education and and grow and, and, and enjoy things. And uh, along the way, we happened to make some pretty good money for the venture capitalist. Well, people like me certainly appreciate the efforts and work you put into creating these tools that make it possible to do the jobs we do and live the lives we leave. And congratulations to you all. Thanks, Pete. Thank you, Pete. And next week, you can come back and hear the rest of the story. You are listening to Eyes on Success. Success, 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 success. Now for this week's final item, how to learn more about Vispero and Freedom Scientific and their products. If people want to find out more about Freedom Scientific and connect with them, how can they do that? So the Freedom Scientific website is freedomscientific.com. You can either enter that in the address bar or any, any reputable search engine will take you there. I host Freedom Scientific's podcast, FSCast, and you can write to me at fscast at vispero.com. And give people an idea of what kind of topics you cover on FSCast. It's a combination of things about our technology and blind people doing interesting things, very often with our technology, but not necessarily always. So a little bit like Eyes on Success. I think you probably uh, have a wider array of topics that aren't necessarily as uh, technically focused, but perhaps we give you a little bit of a run for your money. <laughs> I think you do. You do a good job of hosting that FS Thank cast. You. Thank you. Does Freedom Scientific have a social media presence? So there's our Freedom Scientific website, which is freedomscientific.com. And we are also on Clubhouse, Facebook, Twitter. We do a bunch of Zoom events. Uh, and you can get to uh, information about a lot of that at uh, freedomscientific.com slash training. And in case you missed any of that, you can find that in the show notes associated with show 2301 on our website at www.eyesonsuccess.net. Remember, you can also use the search field on our website to search for shows about JAWS, screen readers, etc. by just putting those search terms in our search field. That's it for show number 2301. Next week on Eyes on Success, we'll be continuing the conversation with Ted Henter, Eric Damery, and Glenn Gordon as they reminisce about their contributions to accessibility and talk about how the JAWS screen reader has had to adapt over the years to advances in computer technology as well as to the evolving requirements of their many users. Thanks for joining us for this first episode of our 13th year, and we hope you'll join us again next week. You've been listening to Eyes on Success, hosted and produced by Nancy Goodman Torpy and Peter Torpy. You can access the full archive of previous shows, subscribe to the podcast, and much more by going to our website, www.eyesonsuccess.net. If you have questions about anything you've heard on the show or have suggestions for future shows, send an email to hosts at eyesonsuccess.net. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.